My name is Shawnee Robinson. I was one of the teachers convicted of racketeering in the Atlanta Public Schools cheating scandal. I was pregnant with my son during the entire eight month trial. It was the longest criminal trial in Georgia history and I'm currently on an appeal bond. The dominant narrative about the Atlanta Public Schools cheating scandal was that educators had cheated on their students' test booklets to get bonus money, to get a payout. But if you look at my case for an example, I was a first grade teacher. First and second grade test scores did not count toward the district targets, and it didn't count toward the national targets, toward the No Child Left Behind Act. I also never received one penny of bonus money because my school never met our district targets. The crux of my story is that I was on trial because I was falsely accused by a former coworker of cheating on my students' test booklets. This former coworker initially told the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, GBI, that she didn't know anything about cheating, but changed her story and got immunity for naming others. During my GBI interview, I remember being asked to sign a pre-written voluntary statement form that basically said I didn't have any knowledge about cheating and that I didn't cheat. I didn't know it at the time, but educators were actually pulled from their classrooms and interrogated by the GBI around the same time, and they were also asked to sign this form. And later we learned that many of those educators were charged with false statements and writings which is a felony. I wrote a book called None of the Above, The Untold Story of the Atlanta Public Schools Cheating Scandal, Corporate Greed and the Criminalization of Educators, so that I could share my story. But I also realized that my story was part of an even larger story about the widespread attack on public education in this country. Under the No Child Left Behind Act, if a school didn't meet its annual targets, the school could either be closed, turned into a charter school, or taken over by the state. Forty states in this country have had cheating allegations. In 14 of those states, it was considered to be widespread cheating. And in Washington, D.C., there were 103 schools that were flagged for suspiciously high test scores. So cheating on standardized tests was a an issue that needed to be addressed across the entire country. But nowhere were black educators dragged to jail and slapped with racketeering charges. Um, that only happened in Atlanta. Um, our trial was used to undermine public education and portray it as a failure. On the same exact day that the prosecution rested in our case, the governor at the time, Nathan Deal, introduced new education legislation called the Opportunity School District, which was modeled after Louisiana's Recovery School District, which would allow the state to take over failing schools. And so our trial in many ways was like a smokescreen in terms of what was happening with education policy at the state level. The trial in and of itself was like a circus. There were repeated calls for mistrial, witnesses who perjured themselves and others who recanted their stories. And our trial judge even stated on the record, perjury is being committed daily here. But he didn't strike anyone's testimony. He didn't declare a mistrial. Um, and stunningly, during our trial, he had a private conversation with the district attorney. He tried to assist a state witness with identifying one of my co-defendants. And he also tried to bully my co-defendants into taking the district attorney's sentencing agreement, which included giving up their constitutional right to appeal. Initially, he had told my co-defendants that we could have a first offender status and an appeal bond. But once he realized that no one wanted to take the district attorney's sentencing agreement, he took it all back and said he wasn't granting any of that. And when our defense attorneys pushed back and said, well, judge, you've already promised them this, he said, well, I guess I'm just an Indian giver. So these are the types of things that we had to deal with with our judge. Two of my co-defendants were sent to prison. They appealed the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the U.S. Supreme Court did not hear the case. And so those two co-defendants had to turn themselves in. One was actually released in June. The other is still in prison. And there are seven of us that are still appealing. 
I'm hopeful that by telling my story, it can shine a light on the way that educators, especially black educators, are being criminalized and scapegoated for problems in our education system that they did not create. It's time for us to find a resolution to the APS cheating trial, and it's time for us to put our education system on trial.